So first of all, what are squads? Squads are small groups of people working on a specific solution to a shared problem. And who can join a squad? Well, anyone interested in contributing as a developer, an architect, in quality assurance, data science, product management, business analysis, subject matter expert, et cetera. So hopefully that's clear that squads are open to pretty well anyone to contribute and join. But how do you join? Well, you can go to a squad's project page or their weekly events page or connect with the squad lead themselves. And we've got a lead for every squad mentioned in here with their talk ID. So if you'd like to reach out to anyone, you certainly can, and we uh, invite you to do that. Jen, do you wanna briefly mention uh, about the community support that we offer for squads? Sure, thanks, Grace. Yeah, so for each squad, we recognize that um, the community can play an important role in providing them with some key support and connecting and getting their work done, um, how to figure out what resources are available. Um, and so there are four of us who are really kind of on, on call um, and actively providing community support for, for the different squads. Um, myself as director of community, so I can help set squads up. Um, I can help with communications, getting um, Zoom, Zoom room set up, putting stuff up on the wiki, blogs, um, all sorts of things, and operational issues. Um, Daniel is our lead community developer, and I'm sure many of you already know what wonderful technical guidance um, he can provide. Um, and, and also in terms of the OpenMRS architecture context. Um, and Grace, of course, is our director of product. She provides product management support and if you haven't met Christine Gachuki at one of our implementers conference wearing her global events manager hat, um, she also wears our QA support team lead hat. And she can provide guidance on QA processes, tools, and resources. And that team has been doing a lot of work around those over the last nine months. So um, if you have a question about any of these um, different aspects and your squad needs some guidance or help, just reach out to one of us. Awesome, thanks so much, Jen. So uh, we'll just continue on. First of all, everyone should be on the same page about presenter guidelines today. Number one is to respect time. So if you are going over 10 minutes, while I think your work is amazing, I'm going to have to cut you off. Secondly, your job is to help us see the big picture. Please help us understand why what you're working on is useful and how we can start to use it. And then finally, focus on the visuals. I know we have a slide deck today, but what we really want to do is show people what we're working on. And attendee guidelines. So uh, whether you're a presenter or not, this applies to you. Please share love, show your interest. Uh, use reactions and comments in Zoom to share the work that excites you. While I'll be running through our deck today, Jen will be monitoring our reactions and comments and we'll be keeping track of those as a way to measure uh, what the community seems particularly excited about. Please listen closely. We'll try to have some time for short questions at the end and share your feedback. Please, after this call, reach out to the squads and let them know your thoughts. That is very valuable. Where do you find those Zoom reactions? Well, actually, it's under the participants button in Zoom. So click that button right now and see if you can't try to find the different reactions that you can use, like a thumbs up or a clap. And then, of course, comments is where you can submit your comments. A note about questions. I'll be honest, we might run out of time today. So um, regardless, please use the, the Zoom chat to post your questions so that even if we can't get to them all today, we will try to get your questions answered by the squads afterwards and we'll publicly share those on top. Without any further ado, let's dive in. So I'll go first um, just to set the tone. We'll start with the OCL for OpenMRS squad. And what you need to know about this squad is that our goal is that there's no more starting your dictionary or concept management from scratch. Imagine that you can build your COVID or cancer dictionary just once and then be able to reuse it across any implementation and share it with any organization. The idea is no more painful migration script management, all those CSV imports. 
across OpenMRS and across all of the languages that we use on this planet, the idea is that this will help enable us to speak the same content language and share our content work and future statistical analysis. If you'd like to learn more, we've got a link in the slides, which we'll share around as well. And we also have several uh, Slack forums where we meet and a weekly call, which you're welcome to join. Reach out to me if you have any questions. The key things to know about what we've been working on this month, our focus has been preparing for a release of a new MVP, minimum viable product, that tries to accomplish the goals I mentioned earlier. We've been testing this heavily the problems that we're trying to solve is to make it easy to find and use public organization or personal dictionaries. You want to be able to quickly combine and customize concepts from any of those, and you want to be able to reuse existing concept work from other implementations and organizations. Our milestones in the squad, we're working hard towards an MVP release for the end of this month. And the goal at first is to support our partners MSF and PIH in adopting the uh, product in production. We are looking for other organizations who are interested to try out the MVP and share their feedback with us. And we're also looking for senior engineers with React experience. So um, without further ado, I'll just give you a quick uh, visual experience of this. So I've signed into our uh, visual environment here and you can see that I'm looking at a whole bunch of miscellaneous dictionaries that I've created that I'm playing with but I could also see dictionaries that my organization shares so here we've got a, a special arm of the WHO's dictionary and I can also see public dictionaries these are dictionaries that they might belong to an organization, um, they might be monitored by someone else, but they've been put here as a way of saying, hey, anyone else is welcome to use this content. If I want to manage some of my work, I can go ahead and I'm going to go into my own dictionary here. You can see I've set up and customized uh, the dictionary itself. I can adjust my preferred and add on additional languages. And I can also manage my releases in here. But I'm going to go ahead and show you uh, how I can look at the concepts that I've set up. So um, I'm an unusually small implementation, clearly, with only four concepts. But if I want to look through hundreds or even thousands of concepts, we've got filters on the right hand side here that will support you to do that. And if I want to create a new concept, there's a couple things I can do. I can import an existing concept. Um, for example, if you currently use a large spreadsheet to manage your concepts, you can simply add the IDs in here and we will automatically walk you through the workflow to get your concepts all set up in this experience. Um, if I want to uh, create my own uh, concept, that's no problem. I can go ahead and create a custom one and it'll walk me through the fields I need to fill out here. This is where I can also manage any mappings that need to happen. But what if I want to release this work that I've done? Oh, and I forgot to mention, um, if I want to use an existing concept, I can also pick concepts that exist in other dictionaries. And then I can edit those concepts without worrying that that will impact those other dictionaries. So now I want to release my amazing terminology work. So you can see I've already got a version that's been released. So I can go ahead and release a new version if I would like to. And I'm going to call it version number two and submit that. Now, I would like people to start using version number two. So I'm going to release that. And in my particular situation, I'm concerned about version one. So I'm going to unrelease it so that others can't access it. But should I want to turn it back on, that's no problem. So thanks for watching. That was a very quick demo of our OCL for OpenMRS MVP work. And uh, I'll now share the screen. And um, if you did want to uh, try out that demo, you are very welcome to. We would love to hear from you. The address is very simple and the password for the demo environment are here as well. So I'm gonna hand it over now to Alan and Bashir to share with us about the Analytics Engine Squad and their work. Uh, okay, hi everyone. I am Bashir. Uh, uh, great uh, 
do you want me to share my screen or we will just use yours and then we'll go forward over the slides? Whichever you prefer. Well, I, I, I only have a slide, so let's just use your screen. Yeah, so um, can you please go to the next slide? Yeah, so this is a, a new squad uh, that has formed recently and we had uh, some uh, some uh, like meetings and discussions over the last few months. I think there were two stand-up uh, meetings um, that everybody who was interested showed their current uh, analytics uh, solution which was very useful. Um, so um, basically the need for analytics, I think many implementers uh, have expressed uh, that need. And these are some reasons that we, you know, we think that you know, uh, such, a, such a separate engine is needed. And by the way, I don't have much to demo today uh, as this is a recent work. There are some prototypes, but it's probably easier uh, to give you the big picture in this meeting and hopefully in next uh, uh, squad showcases we can actually demo something. But basically what we are trying to achieve is that um, we have heard that uh, the OpenMRS data model is basically hard to uh, query for analytics purposes, uh, especially for like, data scientists that are not necessarily familiar with the data model. Um, and also, the current solutions are mostly uh, MySQL based. Um, so there, there is a couple of there are a couple of uh, uh, MySQL scripts to transform the data um, to get it to a form that is more usable. So those pipelines itself, maintaining those is actually uh, difficult. Um, and also, you know, there are uh, metrics and indicators that are common, uh, probably to many implementers. Um, creating those reports is also uh, a difficult task. And, and because all of this is basically, most of it is basically happens in the MySQL uh, environment, uh, when people have uh, more data scalability becomes an issue as well. Um, and, and finally, people uh, have expressed that, you know, the, the analytics workloads may have a, a performance impact on the operational database. So, for example, they run those uh, workloads overnight and these kind of solutions to avoid uh, that problem. So right now we are uh, still in the phase that, you know, we are trying to um, understand uh, what we should include the, in the uh, MVP. So it's uh, it's actually a good time to um, to join the squad if you are interested. We have meetings on Fridays and we are on the Slack as well. Uh, and uh, right now, the main implementer that we are work I mean, uh, I, I personally work for Google and uh, I I am new to the OpenMRS community myself. But uh, Alan, um, who is on the call from Ampat, has been very helpful in. Uh, helping us uh, understand uh, the current solutions and AMPAD is, is the main uh, you know, driver user right now. So if you are interested to be uh, the second user or the third user, we are actually looking for more implementers as well. So uh, in the next slide, I, I go over uh, the big picture. Um, can you please go to the next slide, uh, Grace? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, as I said, there are some uh, prototypes which basically um, is based on uh, this big picture, but uh, but it's still uh, far from a, a, you know production ready product. So, um, on the left, we have OpenMRS and the MySQL, and at the end, we want to get to some uh, dashboards and uh, reports based on that data. So the middle arrows in, in the middle, uh, the, the blue arrows in the middle is our main focus. We, we will have two ways of extracting data from uh, MySQL. Um, one is through uh, a continuous pipeline that any anytime that a change happens in OpenMRS, it is transformed into the downstream uh, analytics data warehouse. And we also have a bulk mode that, you know, when people want to bootstrap their warehouse, they can actually run that to transform the whole data into, into that uh, warehouse. Uh, 
Um, so the current prototypes that we have worked on, uh, like in the streaming case, they, they can work based on um, uh, MySQL bin logs or Hibernate interceptors, but we have heard from people that uh, uh, the, the bin log uh, way and the BZOM is actually preferred. Uh, so we will probably completely switch to do, to do that. And the bulk pipelines that we have right now, again, you know, they can work off of directly uh, the DB uh, tables or the APIs in OpenMRS, but it's probably more likely to eventually to be be mostly based on uh, uh, the database itself directly. Um, and the, when I say the, the data warehouse, it's basically, um, uh, you know, anything that can uh, handle uh, analytics workloads. Um, oh, and, and also, you know, one, one other uh, pathway that, you know, is shown in this slide and we have envisioned is that we should be able to uh, integrate multiple OpenMRS installations into a single data warehouse. So if people have installations in tens of clinics, they can actually uh, bring all the data into the single uh, data warehouse. So if you go to the next slide. Um, so the, as, I, as I was saying that the, the data warehouse is basically uh, have some uh, specifications, but the actual underlying engine can, will have the different choices. So we, we definitely want to support SQL. So whatever data warehouse that we pick, although there might be other APIs as well, but we want that to support ANSI SQL. And the, the second important factor is that we want it to be horizontally scalable. Uh, such that performance becomes uh, no issue if people can afford more nodes. Um, but at the same time, we want to support a wide range of scalability uh, um, setups uh, from, from the cloud on, on one, one end and to a single node uh, to the other side of the spectrum. Um, and of course, we want to support uh, local clusters as well. So if people can have like a Spark cluster, for example, uh, the date, we, we want to have at least one solution that can work uh, on that setup as well. So, and finally, the, on the next slide, um, yeah. So we, we want to be flexible to support um, various types of data that people may may have and they may it might be custom and it might be specific to their uh, implementation so it we should be able to bring those uh, uh, those uh, you know we should have that flexible to bring that data into the data warehouse but at some point we need to pick a schema for the data warehouse and that's actually one of the bigger challenges that i have had over the last few months to figure out what is the right schema Right now, uh, I don't know the answer. I'm not sure if Alan knows the answer. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know if anyone knows an answer that is good for uh, every implementation. So we have basically fall back to uh, 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 a standard, which is fire in this case. So we are actually, the schema that we have picked for the data warehouse is this SQL on fire, which is basically uh, the fire resources, uh, you know, um, uh, projected into like a SQL uh, a scheme. And as I said, you know, people can bring uh, their uh, non-fire uh, data as well, um, but we will heavily uh, depend on the fire module that is being developed uh, either directly uh, using it uh, in, inside our code or querying it from the OpenMRS API. And finally, uh, we want people who are not comfortable with that uh, format or with the um, schema and the API. Um, so if they don't want to write the SQL uh, query that you see on the right, we want to support a metrics API that have some of the uh, uh, metrics, a standard metrics, for example, from PEPFAR uh, implemented already and people can, can just use the API to get their metrics with a few configuration parameters. So that's basically the big picture that you know we are after. Thanks. Thanks, Grace. Thank you, Bashir. Okay, we're going to move next. Speaking of uh, how we manage data, we're going to next move into the fire squad. So I'll hand it over to the technical lead, Ian and Christina. So uh, as you, as as you as you can see and are probably aware, fire fire is becoming a sort of increasingly common standard across 
the world for representing healthcare healthcare data. And the the aim the aim of our squad is to develop the tooling that we need in OpenMRS to support uh, creating and exchanging fire resources with other systems for whatever for whatever purpose that might be. So things like the analytics engine Bashir was just talking about, but also things like maybe DHIS2, maybe uh, insurance systems, healthcare registries, uh, shared health records, and all that sort of thing. So that's kind of the focus of our squad. Right now, the main thing that we're doing is a, right now, the main thing that we're working on is a, uh, a module for OpenMRS that represents the OpenMRS data as uh, as fire resources. I think this is actually on the next slide. So yeah, so what we're working on this month is trying to get to, we've been working on this for a few months now, we're trying to get to our first release. And our, our goal is to have a fire rest API so that you can access lots of open MRS data using, using fire and get that in a properly formatted fire message. Um, so I just have a, I just have a very, very quick demo of some of the stuff that we've done here. If that's okay. I mean, so, screen is yours. There we go. And since this, since what we've developed is an API, I'm going to show it to you through Postman. Uh, so this is a system I've set up with our, with a not quite yet released version of our module. You can see we live under the very memorable URL, OpenMRS WS Fire 2 R4. And so the first thing I was, I was thinking you might want to ask the system is, are there any patients in the system? And if so, how many are there? And you can see that you get this quite simple URL, you get this result bundle, uh, which tells us there are actually 501 patients in the system. And then down here, we have a subset of the patients. I think by default, we provide 10 patients. Of course, the pa since these patients are all randomly generated, they're not terribly interesting. Um, but, you know, we can map in open MRS identifiers, we can map in names, gender, birth date, and all that sort of stuff. Now, if I have this, if I have this patient, this first patient here, Carol White, I might want to know uh, how many encounters we have for Carol. So let me just pick out this, and you can see her identifier is here. We can search by a bunch of other things, but patient identifier is easy, just because, you know, something like patient name, or patient given equals Carol is going to bring up encounters for anybody whose name happen, whose first name happens to be Carol. So let's go with this one. And you can see this returns a nice little bundle of encounters um, with some information about the encounter. There are these generated HTML views, which we don't really care about right now. But you can see it's for patient Carol White, it's at a location and all of that. And then if we want to get the observations for a given encounter, we can simply search like this. So I picked out an encounter ID that I happen to know has some observations that's still tied to this same patient. And we get, again, there are eight observations associated with this. And if we scroll down, we can see all of these, excuse this part. You, we can see, you know, the code, the code for the, for what this observation is, the value for the observation, and the links to the encounter, the patient, all that sort, all that sort of good stuff, right? More interestingly, so more interestingly, I thought, well, so this first thing here is the is the uh, patient's height in centimeters. I thought it might be more interesting if we were looking at maybe a longitudinal view of the uh, of the patient's height. So here's a query that will query that will query for our patient Carol White using the code for height from this system, and we'll sort it by date. And I've included summary equals data just so we exclude all the uh, all the text stuff that was there before. And so you'll see that we get this again this very similar looking. Uh, we get this very similar looking 
set of things, which are all observations of this patient's height over time. Um, you'll have to take my word for that. I realize that scrolling through a JSON document is not going is not terribly interesting. So I thought I might, uh, if I can figure out how to do this, one give me one sec. I thought I might share this other screen with you, where I can make a very similar query against the same system and get back and get back something a little bit more useful. So again, this is the same query for observation, looking for Carol White with the height I uh, sorted, and I'm going to use the JQ thing just to get the, val the height values out of that. Um, and so you can see, here's a list of her height values over time. And if I, you know, we could actually have a time dimension there, we don't. You can see because this is fake and made up data that uh, her height not only varies quite widely, but very improbably from about a foot to six feet over a period of time. Uh, hopefully that's not the case for any real patients, but this is just to demonstrate that we can get this data out and do something semi-useful with it. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ian, that's great. Okay, next up, we'll move on to the COVID-19 squad. So just to frame the background of the squad, for our first few months as the pandemic kind of well became our new normal around the world, the squad was really a collaboration hub where ongoing work was being shared for feedback and collaboration. So for example, quite a few different forms and workflows to handle new COVID-19 care requirements were um, either set up or, or brought for subject matter expertise to the squad. But our focus is now shifting, just as much of the global focus around dealing with the pandemic is as well. So imagine, if you will, a more robust and easier to set up way of setting up your OpenMRS to DHIS2 pipeline. Uh, the idea is, well, frankly, more reporting standards are coming out for COVID, and we want to be ready to support both COVID re reporting requirements and to invest in improvements in our OpenMRS to DHIS2 integration so that um, this can be used for other issues as well, whether it's from managing HIV and TB in populations to uh, future pandemic related reporting. So uh, for example, um, Partners in Health was uh, very generous in how they shared and engaged within the squad uh, with regards to their inpatient care um, uh, changes in their software in response to COVID-19. And you can learn more at the link here in this slide. But uh, where we're going now, we are now focusing on uh, reviewing DHIS2 integration, and uh, we are very interested in talking to implementers who have already been trying to handle more robust DHIS2 integration themselves. So if you've run into problems or if you have things that you think might be interesting to share, we would love to hear from you. Uh, so right now, we're looking through a couple different modules as well as a couple different branches of different modules to try to evaluate where those uh, strengths are so that we can offer a more robust integration. And along with that, we plan to provide more community awareness and training around what kinds of tools are actually out there that could support you and your implementation. Some of the problems that we're hoping to solve, and this is just a short list, um, the mapping between OpenMRS and DHIS2 can often be painful, and we want to help set up an uh, easier uh, data import-export process related to DHIS2 reporting. We are, as I mentioned, looking for implementers who can share their experience with DHIS2 integration, especially if you've had any experience using the connector or reporting modules. And we're also looking for people who would like to pilot and try out uh, an approach. Now, if you are an engineer and you have any kind of DHIS2 integration experience, we would also love to hear from you. Um, on that note, I'm going to share a video generously provided by one of our GSOC students, which captures the direction that we're looking at going. Hi all, I'm here to do a demonstration on DHIS2 reporting module. So I have connected with the DHIS2 instance and in this within this DHIS2 dashboard, I have created a new data set named COVID-19 update. So I will, I will explain um, 
about the structure of this data set a little bit so this is the data set and it has a one only one now currently it has only one data element is number of cases of confirmed coronavirus and it has uh, categories like i'm getting some messages that others can't hear the sound can anyone hear this uh sound right now I, i'm hearing the sound okay perfect thank too. you yeah. great okay i'll carry on then age and gender and we have three age groups here and we have two here we have both genders male and female now uh so i have created a new dashboard as well so this is the dashboard so i just added some charts uh, and stuff so uh next uh, let's uh, export this data set using this import export option of dhsi2 and uh, there's an option named metadata metadata dependency export and i select this data set and the uh, i'm going to exp export it in xml format and yeah i don't need sharing so i will export that so it created a new file so all we have to do is go to the module and there's option to import a data set so we can select the file i have downloaded and i'm uploading it so yes i've uploaded it so we can go to manage data set section it will display the uploaded data set and as well as the previously uplo uploaded data sets so before posting the data we have to map it now all we have to do is map this data set with a report so here i'll click on edit and this will display all the available period indicator reports at open mrs so i click i will choose this uh, previously created report okay if we open this report uh, you can see that uh, all the uh really i i have added uh, some indicators to uh, represent this uh, category option combinations here so i'm just selecting and saving this all and final one and i have saved all the report indicators now we can post this to dhis2 so we here we have post option so next it will ask uh, the location and the period so uh, this uh, the data set i have created uh, uh, the period type of the created data set is monthly so it will ask uh, to choose the month and the location so we have all the mapped locations will be here we have to map uh, all the locations uh, with uh, the dhis to relevant uh, locations so i i i need to select a month here so before uh, doing that i will go through this uh, dashboard i have created so as you can see there's no uh, any data for month of february here and here as well actually this comes from the data set this charts has been generated using that data set so i'm going to push data for the month of february so i'm going to select uh, february here and post data and this will execute that report and post that data uh, to dhis so we can here see that it have import new six uh, data values okay now here we have to regenerate analytics tables within dhis2 and we'll refresh this Here we go now we have data 
relevant for the Feb month of February here. As I said, that this data, uh, these charts uh, generated using that uh, data on that data set, and we can here we can see that we can uh, generate charts according to their gender and age groups. Like that way, uh, we have uh, according to the data we have pushed to DHIS two. Okay, well, thanks so much to Jayasanka, our GSOC student, for putting that together. And uh, while this reflects the direction that we're heading in, we are still very much evaluating um, the connector module uh, that was developed by JBL a while ago. And we'll look forward to hearing from people who would like to share their approaches, ideas, and pain points with us. We'd love to hear from you. And last but not least, we have the micro front end squad. So I will turn it over to JJ to uh, briefly describe the squad before we watch their pre recorded demos. Thanks, Grace. Um, so uh, I think Micro Frontend Squad uh, formed on um, you know more than a year ago now, um, and the goal was to figure out um, how to create a migration pathway from our current UI um, to using more modern Java frameworks um, in a way that leveraged uh, a microservice architecture, um, which essentially lets us bring things in and out. Uh, a little bit more easily um, without worrying about breaking the rest of the system um, and gives uh, different teams the independence um, to choose the technologies they want um, and to work uh, kind of alongside the rest of the application rather than creating lots and lots of dependencies from within it um, as a monolith uh, tends to arrive at. Um, I'm not going to speak too much on um, the micro front ends kind of problems right now. We have a number of demos um, that uh, different members um, of the community um, have put together on their work within our, our squad. Um, do you, you want to just go to the next page? So uh, I think this basically uh, covers kind of uh, what we've been trying to do. Um, and I'd rather use the time on demos. Um, moving forward. Um, so, uh, Grace, do you mind? I put the demo up oh, if you look like you've done it already. All right, so um, go for it. I think we have six demos or maybe five. Different, different um, details and data about a patient uh, that can then be used. My name is Nick Hill. I'm a developer from Fortworks and I'm gonna give you a brief overview of the patient registration micro front end module. So, me, alongside other people from Fortworks and the OpenMRS community, have been working on building this patient registration module that at the forefront is essentially a patient registration form that allows you to capture different, different um, details and data about a patient uh, that can then be used to a later use. So essentially how this works is, what makes it special is that you can supply a thing called a config file. This allows you to configure your patient registration module so that you can capture the types of data um, you can specify the data, you can specify the types of fields you wish to show, how you want to display those fields, are they mandatory, what types of validation, um, and you can then supply these to other instances um, of uh, your micro front end uh, application, and they will have the same configuration. Um, so essentially what this allows to do is to expand and really make uh, patient registration extensible and flexible for your needs. Um, and how this integrates into the system uh, as this is a micro front end, how this works is this is a module and it plugs in. I'm just going to pause for a moment because I'm getting comments about um, the audio. Is anyone else uh, finding it difficult to hear? I can it hear was, it. It was quieter than, than I think when you were doing the demo before, when you ran it before. I can barely hear it at all. Yeah. Okay, then um, I'll just take one quick moment to um, adjust my settings here. My apologies. Yeah, I think it's just volume. So I pumped my volume up and I could hear it fine, but then you guys are all loud. <laughs> we'll whisper. Okay, it doesn't look like there's any other settings I can actually change. So um, my apologies, but uh, we'll work with what we've got here. This is a module and it plugs in to the whole single page application. As you can see here on the dev tools, um, you can see this is my module. It's running on this um, local host and it then plugs in and you can then access the 
patient registration page, just like the other modules, such as patient chart, and we have pay, like um, the home page, for example. These are all uh, micro and modules and all plug into the main single page application. So now we have that. Um, you can just see here with my dummy data what it looks like. Um, but our next steps is really starting to improve the UI with different frameworks, um, starting to really improve the, our configs, how you can actually add or um, record different types of data uh, depending on what um, on what information you supply the config file with. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to my really quick and brief intro. Um, I hope it's been useful and um, I'm really excited to see the future of Microfrontend. Thank you very much. In this video, I'll go over how internationalization is achieved in OpenMRS microfrontends using React i18 Next. Here we see the patient dashboard showing data from widgets that are loaded from the patient chart widgets microfrontend. If we change the language to Spanish and then we load the page, we see that the content of the widgets gets translated to Spanish. This happens because we provided the relevant translation keys and their localized equivalents ahead of time in local specific translation files. Here we see the English translations on the left tab and the corresponding Spanish translations on the right tab. Looking at the patient chart widgets micro front end code, we see that in this conditions overview component, we're importing the use translation hook from React i18 next and then from it, we are deriving the t function. This function accepts a string as the translation key and an optional default value in case the corresponding translation cannot be found in the provided translation files. Notice that the active condition label has not been translated. Let's translate it. We'll wrap the camo case version of the string using the T function and provide the title case version as the optional default value. Heading back to the browser, we'll see that the active conditions label is properly translated. We'll also see that loading up the form, the conditions form rather, shows that translation are working, translations are working as expected. So we'll set the language back to English by passing an optional query string to the URL. And that wraps up an overview of how internationalization is achieved in OpenMRS microfrontends. My name is Ivan Gelari, software engineer at Mecom Solutions and a member of the OpenMRS microfrontend squad. And in this video, I'll be showing you how to use and configure the new attachments UI. The attachments UI is a widget on the patient charts page. You can access, you can add attachments by selecting or dragging and dropping files or using the camera feature. Let's add our first attachment. You can also add attachments using the track and drop feature. Now I will show you how to configure the attachment tab to either disable or enable it. You go to the patient chart report. The two files you need to work with um, OpenMRS ES and patient chart schema and the core views. So to get the tab um, on the page, you add this entry position you want it. Um, currently it's the second tab on the page. Um, you give it a label and a path and a view which is a React component. Um, you have to configure this view in the core views. So the first entry is the core widget definitions. You need to add um, the attachment overview component here which is done at the bottom. Then you also need to add an entry to the core dashboard definitions. Um, which is also at here at the end. So that is all you need to do to enable the attachments. Um, 
widget on your patient, patient dashboard page. To disable it, all you have to do is delete all these entries. No, no, thank you. This is the design for the lab results. Uh okay, I'm just hearing that there were some last minute submissions. So um, this time I'll make an exception. In general, we would like to receive submissions the day before if possible, just so I can set them up for the community. So I will just open. Um, so the features that you're currently seeing are features that are in active development and we're saving something interesting for the last, which is a feature that is uh, currently in design. Uh, so uh, we'll just open this new one. So next up is configuration. Hey, this is Brandon. And I'm going to demonstrate the configuration mechanism for micro front end. It's easy to make a, any micro front end configurable or to configure them. Let's say we want to provide our own logo. When a module is made configurable, documentation is generated into the README in GitHub. So here in the configuration section, we see we're probably interested in logo source. We see that it must be a sprite, and it defaults to the OpenMRS SVG sprite that we see here. Here in the DevTools, we can see that the existing configuration that this module is using, which is all defaults, indeed shows that the logo source is null. At the moment, configuration is provided in a separate file, which is connected through the import map, but it's easy to imagine configuration being editable directly here in the configuration panel, and then saved into a place where it can be version controlled. This should be implemented soon. But for now, let's add some configuration to this file. We fill in the configuration and the expected structure. And then for source, let's say we make a mistake and we set a number, number two. Here, when we refresh, as we expect, the logo fails to load. But if we look in the config console, we see that we have a helpful error message, invalid configuration value two. And it gives us the key of the uh, config object, tells us it must be a string. So that can help identify what we messed up. So let's replace this number with an actual string. Here's the URL to our Global Health Organization's logo. And when we refresh the page, uh, we see the logo of our Global Health Organization has replaced the OpenMRS logo. And here in the configuration panel, we confirm that it is using the configuration that we expect. Hello, my name is Florian Ruppel. In this video, I'll show you how development of a new micro frontend in the OpenMRS single page application world is possible. First, let's activate the DevTools. If we do that, via local storage set item, then we'll see the DevTools in the bottom right corner. This allows us now to add a new module. As a module name, we say that's the add open MRS ESM sample app. And for the URL, we are using HTTP localhost 8080 open MRS ESM sample JS. This means we will lazy load the component when we need it. Let's try it out. We refresh it and hello world is already shown because it's been activated. And the nice thing is it only activates now on the login page. It doesn't activate anywhere else. Okay, last but not least, uh, the final video is an example of the designs that are underway for showing test results. Um, display of uh, the micro project. 
So what you see in front of you is an unstyled um, conceptual design of what this screen can look like. So you have um, the data panels on the left with the different test panels and on the, uh, along on the column axis you have the time and date. Um, the panels have um, the test with reference ranges, any abnormal values are in bold phase. There is the ability to pin um, data if you're scrolling across different times and dates. So you could, uh, for example, pin uh, July 28th and then scroll across uh, to earlier dates. Um, so that's pinned over there. Um, you can also uh, view more if there are and see any kinds of notes, medications, and vitals for that particular date and time. So you're within, this ensures that you stay within the context of that panel rather than switching across to a different screen to view such information. Um, one other point to mention over here is the ability to um, quickly search for a panel um, that you're interested in so you don't have to scroll across multiple test panels to find the data that you're, you could be interested in. Um, one other feature is the ability to graph. So you could select a particular test and click graph and see the trend for that particular um, test. Thank you very much so to the micro front end squad. So we'd like to, uh, JJ, is there anything else you'd like to mention before we move on? Uh, no, I just want to highlight that this has been a wonderful collaboration across uh, many organizations, uh, PIH, AMPATH, uh, MECOM, um, uh, ThoughtWorks uh, were those uh, that were really providing, uh, uh, that were presenting today. But uh, we look forward to engaging as many different people um, and organizations uh, from the community as possible. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, in summary from today, if you saw something that interested you, what should you do? Well, first of all, please contact the squad. Reach out to uh, the people behind the scenes and or the leads who've been mentioned with their talk IDs in these slides and share your feedback with them. They are very keen to hear community feedback. The other thing you can do is join a squad. If you heard about an opportunity today that you're interested in, or if you'd just like to join the meetings and start seeing how you can participate, please do. And finally, reach out to, your, uh, reach out to us if you and your implementation would like to pilot any of this work. The most important thing is that we are serving implementations, so we would love to hear from you if we can support you with any of these ideas. Just a couple announcements before we start wrapping up. I want to make sure everyone knows about three things. So first of all, um, fellowship applications. Uh, we'll come back to that in just a second. I want to give Jen a second to uh, talk about that. Need to know that in September, we're hoping to also have a first, and that's the first implementers showcase, where we, we're hoping that our implementers will do something similar to this in sharing with us what they've been working on and what their priorities are. And the reason for that is so that as a community, we can hear that and incorporate those uh, priorities into our squad's work and make sure we're serving well. And finally, uh, the next of these showcases will be at the end of September, which happens to be October 1st on a Thursday. So please stay tuned and join us next month. Over to Jen to quickly talk about the fellowship applications that are due by August 20th. Thanks, Grace. Yeah, for anybody who hasn't seen it, about a week ago, we posted um, fellowship applications and a description of, of the fe different fellowship opportunities we now have available. We've identified three projects um, that would make good fellowship opportunities for a fellow or two and a fellow mentor, um, some of which you've seen on here around fire messaging, patient level indicator reporting, and COVID-19. Um, so those are the three projects we have identified um, as, again, as I said, we're looking for um, some, a few fellows, three or four fellows, along with some fellow mentors um, to work with those fellows and really grow up their skills. This is, our hope is that this will really kind of fill in um, our mid kind of mid dev level group, um, get some more people from dev one, dev two, up to dev three, dev four, and really kind of expand that our capacity at that level. So these could be developer fellows, these could be QA fellows, these could be um, TPM fellows. Um, follow the link that Grace has provided on the, on the 
slide and you can find out more or you can contact me with any questions. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, given that it is one minute to the end, uh, I'm afraid that we don't have time for questions, so my apologies about that. But as promised, if you can post your question now in the comments, then we will make sure that we follow up with the squads and get those answered and posted in talk. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, for joining today. It was awesome to see 25 people on the call. And we will look forward to the next one. Any comments to wrap us up, Jen? I just want to also thank everybody for coming. This has been great seeing everybody's work, and I hope I hope you all follow along more and come to the next one. Thanks so much, everyone, and please let Jen and I know if you have any feedback on how today's call went and things you would like to see changed or done in the future. We'd love to hear from you. Have a great day, everyone, and we wish you the best uh, for the, your weekend in two days. Bye now.